Hello, my name is Michelle Steele, and this is Faith Builders. I'm so excited you've joined me today. I am thrilled about what we are going to be talking about for the next few weeks. We are starting a new series today, glory to God, and we're going to be talking about effective prayer. You know, this is such a vital part of our lives as believers, knowing how to accurately connect with God and interact with Him in a way that honors Him, in a way that brings glory to Him. And when we're praying, learning that there's more than just an asking prayer, that our communication with God includes the asking, but there's also a lot more in the specifics where uh, prayer is concerned. And so we're going to start today on this subject of effective prayer, and we're going to talk about the ministry of prayer. Before I begin, I want to remind you that we have resources available to help you grow in this subject. We have a study guide that goes with this that has all of the scriptures we're going to be using, the different translations we may use. It has all of the notes and the points and the teaching uh, of it, as well as some questions to help you. For instance, if you're having a Bible study or a family group that you can use, we have uh, flash drives, we have CDs, we have it all available on our YouTube channel for free, and you can partake and receive and grow in the things of God uh, concerning having effective prayer. As I said, prayer is something that is so vital to our communication with God, our interaction, our relationship with Him. And when I first got saved, I remember thinking, this is so awkward. <laughs> I'd never prayed before. I had not been raised in church. I wasn't raised around uh, the Bible or people who were uh, outwardly spiritual. The people who I knew who attended church and read their Bible for for the most part, it would have been my grandparents. They were the ones that I actually saw with Bibles and who attended church every week and would talk a little bit about the things that they believed, but they never prayed in front of me. So I'd never heard anybody pray or had an example to follow. Uh, when I got saved and, and God set me free from the life of addiction and crime that I had been involved in, I was so lacking any skills in how to walk with God or how to talk to him or hear from him because a lot of prayer is hearing not just our speaking and our going to him and our talking but it's also our receiving from him because in prayer that's where we find the details about his plan that's where he speaks to us and he forms our desires and and ministers to us we minister to him in prayer but he ministers to us as well so I want to I want to look first at this foundation of prayer being a part of our ministry to God and how he ministers to us. You know, God wants us to have confidence in our prayers. He wants there to be a a, 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 a an entrance, an approach to him that is confident that we're not coming in uh, with a, with a, an idea that he's going to resist us or he's going to condemn us. But he provided the blood of Jesus so that we could enter in boldly. It says that we come through a new and a living way in the book of Hebrews. That new and the living way that Jesus made through the sacrifice of his life. That new and the living way that's been provided by his shed blood. So that the blood purges our conscience when we enter into the presence of God. We come confident. And this is one thing he said about prayer in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. It says, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. Do you hear all the confidence in that phrase? We know we have. That is a, a description of faith. This is our interaction with God. We know he hears us. 
that confidence is vital. And that confidence comes by our interacting with him through his word and in communion with him in prayer. And the ministry aspect of this interaction with God, how we minister to him and for him, it comes from what Jesus Christ provided in our salvation. We are made priests who minister to God and for God. First Peter 2, 5 is my first confirmation of this concept that we are made priests unto God. It says in first Peter chapter two, verse five, and I'm living, I'm using the new King James. It says you also as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. This is speaking of every believer, every person who's accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord. You may not be called to fivefold ministry. You may not be called to minister in the pulpit, but you are called to minister to God with offerings of love. I'm talking about offerings of Lord. I bring you the sacrifice of praise. I come to you, Father, committed to your plan. That's ministering to God. That's ministering to him with our fellowship and with our, our attention. So it says we're a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Yielding our life to God is a spiritual sacrifice. Being obedient to his will raising our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's a sacrifice living our lives every day in, in, in attention to what he has for our life by looking at his word and following the promptings of his spirit. That's ministering to God. And so our life is a life of ministry, but in this, we are equipped to minister to God in prayer. Isaiah 61 Verse six says, but you shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you ministers of our God. You'll be named priests of the Lord, ministers of our God. And so when you look at your personal time with God as ministry, that you are anointed because of your place in Christ, you are anointed. You are in Christ, the anointed one with his anointing. And you are, you have the cleansing of the blood and the anointing of God upon you to approach God and to serve him in a way that a person who hasn't accepted Jesus isn't equipped with yet. If they would ever accept him, they could receive the same equipping of the washing of the blood, that sanctification and the anointing that provides the, the, um, equipping for service. Revelation 1, 5, this is one of my favorites. It says, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his father. This is a connection. It's it's not separate. The, he's washed us from our sins and made us kings and priests unto God and his father. And our prayers are a part of this ministry of priests unto God. Isaiah 56, seven says, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. When we bring ourselves before God and present ourselves to talk to him, to yield ourselves to him, to inquire of him, to seek his wisdom, to, to bring the prayer of praise and worship, to bring the prayer of intercession for other people, to bring the supplications, to bring the, the prayer of commitment, consecration before God. Those are all things that we are received in by God because Jesus has made us priests to God. So our prayers are a, a vital part of this ministry that God has called us to, the ministry of prayer. 
the church collectively, I know each of us, we're members of the body of Christ, but when we gather together, we become a temple or a house unto God. And I'm going to read the Amplified of 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. It says, do you not discern and understand that the whole church at Corinth, and that would include the church in your city, the church in Little Rock, the church in DeSoto, Kansas, the church in wherever you live, the whole church, you are God's temple, his sanctuary, and that God's spirit has his permanent dwelling in you to be at home in you collectively as a church and also individually. So the, the spirit of God dwells in us. And when we minister to the Lord in prayer, we're ministering to him intimately. We're not ministering to him far away where we're sending it and he's going to get it in a light here. No, we're ministering to him at that moment out of our heart. And then first Peter uh, two, five again says that we are built up a spiritual house. We're looking at the fact that the church collectively is a temple or a house to God and we offer spiritual sacrifices. You know, when, when we pray, what happens to our prayers? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about what happens to my prayer? I just pray it and it comes along cross like a text on and God checks his his prayer text line and and he sees your prayer and and what happens to your prayer what how does God treat your prayers are they just you pray them once and then they're gone well according to scripture our prayers are present at his throne listen to this revelation 5 8 when he had taken the book the four beasts and the 20 uh, the four and 20 elders fell down before the lamb this is talking about a worship moment in heaven having every having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors which are the prayers of the saints our prayers are collected we're ministering to the Lord of a spiritual substance from our heart. We are speaking words of, of commitment and love and dedication to him. We're asking him things from our heart. We're making supplications from our heart. And there, those prayers, those spiritual um, substances that come from our heart, they're not just dissipating. They're collected and they're present before the throne of God. Now, the, the prayer of the righteous the prayer of the believer, the prayer of the person who has accepted Jesus Christ and Lord, it brings the power of God on the scene. And I want to read to you from the book of James. And the book of James is a place that we should visit often to find out what happens when we pray, because we need to know from, from, the, from the revelation of God's word what is taking place when we pray? And it says, if any among you is afflicted, this is James 5 and verse 13, is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Now, the word afflicted is not talking about sickness or disease, like an affliction. People use that word to describe sicknesses or infirmities. This word afflicted means under the pressure of temptations. I think that applies. We can all find times in our life that we've been under the pressure of, of difficulties, uh, temptations. This word also means a mental battle, a mental battle. If anybody is facing a mental battle, mental, emotional, or relational difficulties, what do we do? What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to call somebody else's prayer line and say, hey, I'm, a, I've, I'm facing a mental battle. Pray for me. No. Are we supposed to go to the pastor? And it's good to have prayer of agreement. But after I've followed this verse, it says, if anybody is under mental pressure, under emotional or relational difficulties, what do you do? Let him pray. Let him pray. There's there's change that takes place when you pray in that situation. There is a, an opening of God, an opening to the door for God to come into that situation when you pray. If you're facing that difficulty, 
pray. And then it says, if there's any Mary, let him sing songs. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. If he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I'm going to say that last phrase again. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then from this moment with that statement that the effectual prayer of the believer, the person who's been made righteous by the blood of Jesus, every, every person who's saved, this applies to you. This applies to you. You may not think that your prayers are going to do much. And that's why you put, maybe not you, maybe somebody else. Maybe I'm talking to somebody else right now. And they, they put their praying off on other people. They'll get other people to do their praying for them. And, and they are not confident that when they pray, it will change. That when they pray, they are authorized in that situation. You know, you might ask somebody else to pray for you, and they may not have the same authorization in the spirit realm to pray over your situation. You know, for instance, I'm authorized as the mother of my children to pray over them in a way that some random person who doesn't even know me, that person doesn't have the same standing in my situation. They don't have the same liberty. They can pray, they can pray from one aspect, but from my situation, I'm I've got I've got things I've got um I've got a standing in this situation. I've got an investment. That's the word I'm looking for. I'm invested in this family. I've got the authority to pray differently. And so if I if I don't take that place and I just let other people do my praying for me, but they're not authorized. They they don't have the same jurisdiction that I have. They don't have the same influence that I have in the spirit realm. Then I'm I'm limited to what li- what they can pray from their position in my situation. But if I'll take my place and I'll pray the effectual fervent prayer of the believer, the righteous, those who are born again, the effectual fervent prayer of the person in Christ makes tremendous power available, the Amplified says. Power available to the situation, power available for God to work in that situation. We want God to work, but he said, I want you to pray so that I can have the liberty to work in that situation. And then, you know, in James, it gives us an example and it gives us an example of a man under the, under the old, in the old Testament, under the old, um, uh, I say the old, the first covenant, he was limited because he wasn't blood washed. He wasn't the righteous, but God used Elijah to pray in a way that caused such a change in the situation. And then he's giving this an exa- as an example for you and I. It says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. He was a person like us. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And guess what happened? It didn't rain. It rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain. Well, we know from from looking at the story that this was God's plan. God wanted this to happen. So why did Elijah need to pray if God wanted it? This is where we need to let the scripture bring a structure to our thoughts. Because some people have accepted an idea that's not scriptural. And they say if God wants it to happen then it'll happen. If God wants it, if it's the will of God, it's going to happen. Well, let's, let's look at this example from scripture. God wanted, he said, go tell Ahab that it's not going to rain until you say. So it was God's idea. God initiated this plan 
So why did Elijah need to pray? And why is this written as an example for you and I? And then when God said, now go tell him it's going to to rain, why did Elijah go pray after God said, tell him, right? If the if if God wanted it, then what difference did it make if Elijah prayed or not? Do you see the example? He says, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous makes tremendous power available. And Elijah prayed, and he prayed until his servant saw the, the evidence of the rain, that there was a cloud. It wasn't big, but it was enough that it was evidence and Elijah came down and he said, you need to get your on your chariot, King Ahab, because I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. He was responding to what he had prayed, what he had received in prayer, what the will of God was. He was co- collaborating with God in prayer. He was cooperating with God in prayer. That's what Daniel did. Daniel was reading the Bible. We see him in Daniel chapter 10. He was reading the Bible and he understood by by studying the scripture that there was something that was supposed to take place that hadn't taken place yet. And he set himself in Daniel chapter 10 to begin to pray. And, you know, an angel came to him and an angel said, I have come in response to your words. In Daniel chapter 10, in the good uh, uh, God's word translation, it says, in response to your prayer, angels were dispatched with understanding, with wisdom, with bringing him the message. And why did he come? Because it was God's will. He said, I've come in response to your words. Your prayers initiate a response from God. Heaven's forces are released into our situation when we, um, when we minister to God in prayer. We don't just go with our list of, hey, I want this, I want this, do this for me, do this. No, we learn how to serve the Lord in prayer, how to come to him with worship, how to spend time communing with him, receiving from him. We, we definitely have the privilege of making those requests, asking God to, to intervene in situations, asking God to help us with the finances or with the changes that we need to make in our lives. But when we recognize that it's not just a, an, an approach to make these petitions and then to exit the room, but to minister to the Lord. Let me read this. Ephesians 6, it says in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance. Well, that's a different description than just walking in, making your petition, and then leaving the room. No, we're praying with perseverance and supplication for all the saints. The Amplified says, with all manner of prayer and entreaty. And as we go forward in this study, we're going to look at the different types of prayer. We're going to learn about how these these different types of prayer should be administered, how we can give ourselves in this perseverance and in this supplication to the Lord. What's the difference between intercession and supplication? We're going to answer that. So I encourage you, get the resources. We've got flash drive CDs. You can listen to it on the podcast. You can find it on our YouTube channel. But you need to learn with us this effective prayer. I'm so glad that you tuned in today. I am thankful for the opportunity to build your faith and to to share with you from the Word of God buildfaith.net is our website. You can watch our live stream. You can connect to those YouTube channels. You can even find a link to our podcast and different resources available. And we are so grateful that you tuned in today. Thank you to all of the partners of Faith Builders for being a part. Remember to build your faith and frame your world by the word of God. 
Amplified Bible tells us in James 5.16, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic, and it's working. Our prayers are powerful instruments for God's power to affect change in our lives. Through our relationship with Jesus Christ, we are equipped to pray effectively. The series Effective Prayer is exactly what you need to help you identify the accuracy and advantage you have in prayer. In this series, Pastors Philip and Michelle Steele explain the various types of prayer and how to apply them. The Holy Spirit helps us in prayer. The legal position of praying in Jesus' name. The difference between supplication and intercession and much more. This insightful 12-part series is available in digital or physical formats starting at just $20. In addition to the teaching series, you can also get Pastor Steele's book, Refusing the Care. In this book, Pastor Steele provides biblical truth and practical insight to help you resist worry and refuse the cares of everyday life with an understanding of how faith provides a foundation against anxiety. With practical illustrations, Pastor Steele relates lessons he's learned as the Lord revealed the danger of allowing cares to prop the door open to the enemy. Available for $15, this book will help you recognize wrong perceptions and help keep the door closed to carrying care. Don't miss this special offer. The 12-part series Effective Prayer in various formats includes a study guide with all the verses and teaching points to help you study along and strengthen yourself in truth. Also, the book Refusing the Care will provide you with a guide to keep you out of care and anxiety. Call the number on your screen now or go to buildfaith.net to order. Call or go online now. What is Healing School? It is a designated time to learn about God's provision for the healing of our bodies. Whether you are facing a physical attack against your body or want to build up your spiritual immune system to remain strong and healthy, this weekly class is for you. Join Pastor Philip Still each Tuesday at 1030 a.m. at 10500 West Markham in Little Rock or online at buildfaith.net's live stream. Each class is archived and available in a playlist on our YouTube channel at Faith Builders International. Classes are free and open to the public. Join us this week at Healing School. This is Pastor Philip Steele, and I want to invite you out to Faith Builders Church, where people's faith is being built by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit is moving in the lives of His people. You can visit us at either of our locations, either at 10500 Markham, right there in the city of Little Rock, Arkansas, or 8390 Peoria Street in the city of DeSoto, Kansas. We would love to see you at either of our locations. We have a full service ministry. We have children's ministry from nursery age all the way up to teenage. We have ministry for men, ministry for women. The Holy Spirit is moving and people's lives are being changed. I hope to see you soon at either of our locations. Until then, build your faith and frame your world by the Word of God.